Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we invite your spirit once again to be with us as we open your word together. And we thank you for the Sabbath and for each person who is studying these things. May you give us wisdom and understanding that we can be changed in character. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for that presentation earlier, Dwight. I'm just going to touch on a few things here that we were uh, discussing. So basically, the idea here of these chiasms, the purpose of a chiasm, what is the most important part of a chiasm? The center. Why is the center important? Isn't it also a doubling? Well, yeah, it's by nature going to have a doubling. But the center is important because why? It establishes a way mark. Okay. Why is the center of the 70, 70th week important? Because it was the time of crucifixion. Right, so it's the cross, right? right? So so the purpose of a chiasm is, is that it points to Christ, to his work in some way. It typifies his work. And and so we, we have all of these chiasms. We have these, these center points. You know, the first major chiasm we have is the one dealing with the uh, the 430 years, right? The two periods of 215 years where we have the transition from um, Cain into Egypt, right? And, and there's other chiasms within that history. And so we have lots of different structural chiasms that occur. Um, and, and in a sense, you can sort of say, well, the center is kind of like a turning point as well, right? So, so there's lots, lots of things about the center. Now, obviously, if you have a chronological chiasm, you're always going to have numbers on either side of the center that are going to be the same. And, and they're going to be symbolic sometimes, right? So here you have the 54 days. We know in uh, Samuel Snow that he's going to be there at midnight. And at midnight, that's going to be the fifth day of the fourth month. And he's going to proclaim the 10th day of the seventh month. So like here in 457 BC, we can see that these symbols... Uh, and the 69 days can be understood as 70 days as well, right, with the 10th day of the seventh month in the center. You know, we also actually have at the center of the 10th day in the seventh month and the 20th the day of the ninth month. What's the date in between those? So if you take that uh, uh, 10th day of the seventh month, you go to the 20th day of the ninth month. What's the center? You get 10th day, seventh month right there. What are you saying? Yeah. What's the center of this 10th day of the seventh month and the 20th day of the ninth month? In that 69 oh, days, what's going to be the center? Well, the center of that, okay. So Tishri is the seventh month, Heshvan's the eighth month, Kislev's the ninth month. So in the center... Would that be the 15th day of the eighth month? Yeah, so the 15th day of the eighth month, which, which you know, we have as a symbol as, as the midnight cry. It's also the counterfeit uh, day of atonement uh, that occurs in First Kings... Um, Chapter 13, verses 1 to 5, where you have uh, Jeroboam offering up on the altar in Bethel on the 15th day of the eighth month. So, so you know, there, there's all of these dates and these structures, These they, they all fit together. They all speak to each other. Now, so with uh, Dwight's presentation, he dealt with symbolic use of numbers, just as we're dealing with here. And again, the reason we're, we're doing this study on the symbolic use of numbers uh, the primary reason is because they're being rejected in part uh, by this movement. That is, they will take some numbers and and use them, uh, but they, they, they don't want to use other numbers. So there's some things that they don't want to use. So they don't appear to want to use dates. And now I don't fully understand what Jeff meant when he said, where we started first started to go wrong was the acceptance of midnight because uh, he doesn't elaborate upon it. At least I haven't heard him elaborate upon it. Now, I don't know if he means just midnight as a symbol or whether how we were trying to apply midnight, but we can't say that midnight uh, should be rejected as a symbol. I mean, that would just be, that would be a rejection of Millerite history. So when we look at this chart here, I know this chart's really busy, but, you know, when we deal with Samuel Snow's letters, um, you know, we have these chiasms, right? We have this chiasm where May 2nd is the center. 
and that, that's the kind of the pinkish color there. So that's going to go from his first letter when it's written to um, his last letter published on July 18th with May 2nd in the center. We looked at that. But the primary chiasm in Millerite history is the chiasm of midnight, right? That's going to be July 21st. So I know it's hard to see. There's so much stuff on here. So I'll just kind of blow it up a bit and move over here. So with this dash line, these dash um, half circles, um, you can see July 21st, the fifth day of the fourth month is the center. And that's going to be Boston. And this is typified in 457 BC by the chiasms there. And, and we see, we see these types of things even in, in the story of Joseph. Cause in the story of Joseph, um, there's going to be, um, you know, these 22 years with 17 years on either side, right? With, um, I could show you the diagram, but, but the point is that you could take the 22 and you divide it in uh, to 11 years. So from when, Joseph is sold into slavery. He's 17 years old. And then 11 years later, he's going to interpret the dreams of the butler and baker. And then 11 years after that, he's going to interpret. Let me see. He's, he's um, 11 years after that, the dream is going to be fulfilled. So it's going to be um, nine years after he interprets the Pharaoh's dream. So there's going to be two years before that. So two years after the dream of the butler and baker, he interprets the Pharaoh dream, Pharaoh's dream. Nine years later is dream is fulfilled that he had when he was 17 and then he's going to be 17 years with his father before Jacob dies so so there's these 17 11 11 17 and 11 times 17 is what 187 yeah so 187 right so in the story of Joseph we have July 18th symbolized and and it also occurs in in Millerite history right so so, and it's an extremely important symbol I mean, because it's from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month being the 187th day of the year. So so all of these symbols end up coming together. And I don't think that we could extract some of them and say they're significant and other ones and say they're not. We, ha we have to accept all of these symbols because they're in God's word. They're placed there. Some are more prominent than others. Some it takes time to discern. That is, you have to, in the story of Joseph, you, you actually have to figure out the chronology of, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and, and so forth. You have to figure out the chronology of those events. And, and if you draw them on the line, you can easily see uh, the structure, and that these structures exist in 457 and in 1844. I don't think that a Seventh-day Adventist can just dismiss them as coincidences, especially to the mathematical impossibility of them being coincidences, right? You, you, you apply Ezekiel's visions included in there with, you know, him prophesying on the fifth day of the fourth month, beginning his prophesy on July 21st. And, you know, the last date written being the 10th day of the seventh month and, and all the other uh, dates in Ezekiel. So Ezekiel can't be a coincidence. Samuel Snow's letters can't be a coincidence. 457 BC can't be a coincidence in its connection with 1844. And, and the story of Joseph can't be a coincidence. And, and, and the chronology of Noah's flood can't be a coincidence. All of these contain chiasms. And, and there's more, right? There's all kinds of chiasms that connect the story of Joseph uh, to the time of Christ and to Millerite history, you know, with the 1,640 years. You know, so just over and over again, we have all of these structural chiasms connecting 252 and 187 and, and other symbols. So we have to argue that, that this is, is real, right? That it's, 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 not, it's not something that we just contrived or made up. It's definitely not something that Satan would have control over. Now, where we want to go today, though, is going to address a little bit more about Samuel Snow's letters. And, and this is going to bring us to 2018. So in 2017, we come to understand Samuel Snow's letters. 
so this this I call uh, this this is the one I want I think yeah so the Samuel Snow's letters template so in Samuel Snow's letters we we just have this dealing with his letters themselves so we know that his first letter is written on February 16th and it's published six days later. Uh, somebody has a comment no I was just saying these are the published letters here uh, just the published yeah. ones and these are these are the ones that are published so February 16th he writes that letter that's going to to Brother Southard, and it's going to be published on February 22nd in the Midnight Cry. So it's going to be on a Thursday that it's published, right? It's going to be republished in the Signs of the Times on a Wednesday, and and that's going to be April 3rd, 1844, right? And then what we're going to have is there's going to be 16 days later is going to be the Great Disappointment, or the, the first disappointment, pardon me. Right. So you're going to have the first disappointment, the first day of the first month. Now, May 2nd, we're going to have his second letter published. We, we don't know when he wrote that one. And then on June 22nd, he's going to write his third letter. Right. And that is going to be the Pentecost letter. So the June 22nd, in 1844 is Pentecost. And, and that letter is published June 27th. So it's going to be published five days later. And and the significance of that is June 27th is the 11th day of the third month. And if you double the 11th day of the third month, you get the 22nd day of the sixth month, June 22nd. So so there's this neat little relationship between the writing of this letter on Pentecost, its publication five days later, that points to June 22nd. We know June 22nd is a symbol that Jeff marked out as a symbol for FFA. Right. So so we have this symbol and, and Jeff marking this as a symbol for FFA had no idea about June 22nd when he did that. As far as I know, I don't think he he understood anything about Samuel Snow's letters at that time uh, when he he noticed this June 22nd date. OK, now there's 26 days from June 22nd to July 18th. Now, you could also count it as 391 and a half days, okay, that is, to the next July 18th. But as a symbol, uh, you know, in, in reality, it's 26 days, but but it, it can symbolize what we see below. So what we see below is what happened in this movement in 2018. So in 2018, uh, Jeff is going to close the Sabbath in Italy on June 9th. Uh, with a prayer at 9:11 p.m. and and that's going to be used by and, and we're going to look at this in more detail as well. But here I just wanted to first start with this comparison with Samuel Snow's letters. And then we'll go look into detail more regarding what happened in 2018. And then six days later is June 15th, and we're we're going to deal with the symbol of June 15th. Uh, but June 15th is connected to. Uh, Josiah Lich's prophecy, um, I believe is it. I'm trying to think. No, that's July 15th. Yo, know, June 15th is just, uh, I'm trying to remember exactly. I know it's the second day of the fourth month. So it's, it's three days before the fifth day of the fourth month. So I'll, I'll deal with that later. So for now, we'll just, that's what I marked in 2018. I marked June 15th and I'll explain why later. Um, and that's going to be 120 days, which it represents the 120 years of the United Israel. And then we have 391 and a half years uh, to uh, the end of the kings of, of of Judah. Right. So so I marked 120. Um, Daniel from Brazil marked 126 days to October 13th, 2018. So on October 13th, 2018 at noon, I'm at Lambert Church. <coughs> Excuse me. Daniel from Brazil is talking about uh, the time setting that the movement has accepted and mentions his 126 day prophecy. And, and this he had figured out on July 27th. So on July 27th, he makes this prediction about October 13th. Now, July 27th happens to be from Josiah Lich's prophecy. So we have that date there. And then 16 days later, 
is August 11th. And August 11th, of course, now it says 16 days. Well, we know it's 15 days from July 27th to August 11th. But if I counted it inclusively, it would be 16 days. And that just matches with above. And sometimes we have inclusive counts and sometimes um, uh, cardinal in counts. So, for instance, when uh, Daniel from Brazil counted the 126 days, he actually didn't count it from June 9th. He counted it from June 10th because he was counting from when uh, Parminder was preaching about time setting. So he's going to do an inclusive count by saying it's 126 days to October 13th. I'm counting from when the day begins, which is at sunset. And so I'm just counting from June 9th, the 126 cardinal days. They still end up on October 13th. Now, in, in our time, the difference between the Gregorian and the Julian dates is 13 days. So whatever date it is today, today's the 16th of March. 13 days from now on the Julian calendar, the, it will be the 16th of March, right? So you can see the 13 days from April 19th to May 2nd is paralleled with the 13 days from August 11th, Gregorian in 1844 to August 11th, Julian, or not 1844, in our history, in, eight, in 2018. Now, nothing happens on August 11th on either of these dates, right? But just as a symbol, they exist. August 11th exists as the center of a chiasm. And, and so it points to Josiah Lich's prophecy that we should be paying attention to. That's what I understood as I looked at this. And then we have the August 11th lining up with May 2nd. And then from October 13th, 2018 at noon, I count the 391 and a half days and find that brings us to midnight commencing November 9th, 2019. And I don't, I don't know why it says 11th day, ninth month underneath that it should be. Is it the 11th day of the ninth month? I don't think so. Anyway, does this make sense to people that what happened in Samuel Snow's letters was repeated in this movement? Yeah, I can see. I can see it makes sense. Now, this is extremely <laughs> unlikely to have occurred by chance. Right. So this chiasm was not noticed by me until 2018. So I knew about the other chiasm with midnight as the center. We knew about that. And the other chiasm where we're going to have May 2nd as the center, right? So if you go from February 16th to May 2nd, it's 16 days and two months. And then you count 16 days and two months and you get July 18th. So we knew about that chiasm. But this chiasm wasn't found till 2018. And it's this chiasm that I actually first made the prediction regarding July 18th, 2020. But I used... Um, the Julian date of July 18th. So, so I was connecting it with Ezekiel. So it's kind of, there's, I don't know how much I should go into detail about this. You um, said the Julian, the Julian was uh, uh, July 27th? No. So July 18th. So, so I was first using Ezekiel. So I shouldn't say it was first with this, but because of this, because of July 18th, I was able then to see this before I had July 18th on the Gregorian calendar. So there's, oh, there's kind of steps. So the first thing is we noticed the 391 and a half days on October 13th. And because of this, this prediction of, of Daniel from Brazil being made on July 27th, I then was able to construct the diagram on the bottom, right? So I was able to construct that diagram before I had July 18th as a date in 2020. So that means I, it wasn't after I had July 18th that I had this structure on the bottom. I had this structure on the bottom in October of 2018. I never figured out July 18th until November. So, so I'm figuring this out. I'm taking this symbol from Josiah Lich's prophecy. And so I know it's going to be connected to Josiah Lich's prophecy. But the first thing that I do is I create this diagram. And that reaffirms the connection with the Josiah Lich's because the center of that is August 11th. But then I also know that Ezekiel has a prophecy. So I'm going to use Eze Ezekiel's prophecy. And so we're going to look at that 
I don't know how far we're going to get today. Uh, but I want to look at how we came to understand July 18th. So the first thing is I have this diagram on the bottom. And I compare it to Samuel Snow's letters, right? So then I see that what happened in Samuel Snow's letters has happened in our history. And to me, the significance there has to do with the prediction before midnight, right? That is, I believe that November 9th, 2019 is a prediction before midnight. Now, uh, tomorrow morning on, on the uh, Sunday, because we're, we're studying Daniel chapter 11, I'm going to go through and I'm trying to think what it, what it, what it is I'm doing. I think that was it last night that we talked about November 9th. Yeah. So that's going to be not Sunday. That's going to be next Friday. I'm actually going to go through Stephen's study on November 9th, 2019 of how he came up with November 9th, 2019. So there's a lot of things we have to, to look at. There's lots, lots of, lots of balls in the air and we have to sort through them. But I want you to understand the progression of events. So so even before we have November 9th, 2019 by tests, uh, Stephen has made that prediction of November 9th, 2019. And and I'm going to look at that Friday night because it's part of our study dealing with uh, E.J. Wagner. Right. Uh, can I just clarify? Yeah. yeah. So uh, I had noticed November 9th before. Um, 1849. Yeah. But it was only really when uh, Tess emphasized November 9th, 2019, that I then made a link right. to being 100 and whatever to 2019 then relating to that. But well, you had an idea about the 30 years, right? When, yeah. when did you? Is that going to be after test says November 9th, 2019? Well, I mean, I sort of seen it. And when, t when test came up with uh, November 9th, 2019, I done a presentation in Wales that related to what I'd seen about November 9th. And yeah. uh, I, I believed, it, it, to me, it was, I was, it made me supportive of it. My previous right. study, I was, I was able to, Mm -hmm. And then I, uh, yeah, just sort of made connections then with, um, towards, you know, with the 126 years. Okay. So when you gave that, that letter to Jeff, the email to Jeff in 2018, because Jeff is going to read the email in, uh, August of 2018. He's going to read it at the camp meeting in Alberta. Yes. Uh, but not the whole thing. Right. So he's going to be really interested in the connection with 1844, with the hundred and uh, eighteen hundred and forty four years. Right. Eighteen hundred and forty four days. No, not the days. He's just interested in the years that you're going to take that from when Christ enters into uh, begin his work in the holy place on Pentecost. You're going to have, um, you're going to take years of 359 days, right? Take out all the days of atonement. And, and he's just going to be interested in the fact that it's 844 years to October 22nd, 1844. He doesn't fully understand it, but he doesn't pay attention to the 1844 days left out, right? Uh, no, it was included, uh, the 1844 days. I sort of mentioned that November 9th, but yeah, he doesn't really. Yeah, he never mentioned it, right? No. So he, he didn't seem to notice that. It was only when he came to Wales in December, I think it was 2018. Yeah. That then I, I had sort of high highlighted it to him the November 9th thing. And he picked yeah. that up then. Yeah. He began to sort of uh, connect it. But that was after a test. That was about a month or so after a couple yeah. of months. Yeah, but he, but you did explain to him to that in, in, to, in uh, August or July, whenever you sent the email to him originally. Just that you never connected it to 2019, you're saying? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, so your, 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 um, experience is kind of similar to mine in that when I, you know, when I heard Tess's presentation on October 3rd and, and everybody was saying, 
Oh, she's saying that probation is going to close November 9th, 2019. Now, I'm pretty skeptical in the system that she used to come to that conclusion. Like, to me, that seemed kind of like a leap. And, and then what does it mean probation is going to close? So I wouldn't say I was opposed to, to what she was saying. It's just I had a lot of questions. But I had studied things earlier, and I had studied the 391 and a half years. Right. Also, I'd studied Josiah Lich's 391 years and 15 days, which is a half a month. So, you know, in 2016, I had pointed out the parallel uh, between Ezekiel and um, the prophecy of Josiah that we have in the Bible and Josiah Lich's prophecy. So, so obviously when I, on October 13th, when I do the count and I have this, uh, this prediction by um, Daniel from Brazil, I'm naturally going to notice that the 391 and a half days to November 9th is significant. So both of us have uh, an experience of something that we studied independent of what Tess was doing, testified that that date was correct. But we didn't necessarily buy into everything she said in how she came to that date. Right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you, you were kind of in the same position that I was in. And uh, so to understand, you know, what was happening in the movement is that the movement was trying to sort through regarding this prediction that we were supposed to make. So the movement we knew since 2017 or probably even earlier, we knew that the movement was going to make a prediction. So this was, I think, uh, first proclaimed in, I think Jeff came up with that, with that in 2014, uh, this idea that we were going to make a prediction regarding Islam. And in 2015, you know, he talked about it at the camp meeting in Alberta. And in 2017, we had a name for it, the prediction before midnight. And, and then we connected it to Samuel Snow's letters. So Cabo is going to connect it to the May 2nd letter, which is the center of a chiasm. And, and I just say all of Samuel Snow's letters are involved in the prediction before midnight. And the fact that we make a prediction before midnight on October 13th, 2018, that's pretty strong evidence that based upon these things to happen impossibly by chance, right? They could not be by chance that we now have this date and it's witnessed to by Tess, by um, Stephen and myself, three different ways in which we now we, we understand November 9th and November 9th, 2019, uh, you know, when we first have it, of course, we don't fully understand what it means. So there is a theory. It's a close of probation. Um, a lot of people are believing that after November 9th, 2019, they're not going to sit anymore. Things like that. So there was a lot of fanaticism attached to it. And I didn't attribute that to Parminder and Tess. I just attributed it to people's natural, t- natural tendency to be fanatical. Um, for her to get baptized, too. <laughs> the Russians yeah. are baptized. Yeah, yeah. So there's, I fell, I fell, I fell into that one. Yeah. So there's all these things happening that didn't really make any sense. Um, so there was a lot of fanaticism associated with it. So, you know, that made me a bit leery, but except God kept giving light and, and the next light that he's going to give is July 18th. But you can see how this November 9th, 2019 structure with Samuel Snow's letters points to July 18th as a symbol, right? So you can see, even though July 18th is 26 days later, that's when his last letter is published. If you add a year, 365, you're going to get 391 and a half. So that's, that's what's happening in, in 2018 regarding Samuel Snow's letters and July 18th. Okay. So I'm just seeing what, that's just the same thing. So, so the next step that's going to happen. Any questions about Samuel Snow's letters? Does that that make sense? What we're we're saying about Samuel Snow's letters of how that 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 points to this, this movement. You know, this movement has fulfilled Samuel Snow's letters in the prediction before midnight. But remember, Samuel Snow 
he's he's then going to make a prediction that deals with the 187th day of the Jewish year, the 10th day of the seventh month. Uh, so here on this page, you just see again uh, the two days in the six or the two months and 16 days or 77 days from February 16th to May 2nd, and then to two months and 16 days or 77 days from May 2nd to July 18th. And so I'm going to present that 777 days before November 9th, 2019, and then 391 and a half days before November 9th, 2019. I'm going to uh, apply the 391 and a half years of the kings of Judah and, and see the connection there. So you can see how God was leading step by step in understanding things. Now, what happens in 2018 is uh, the diagram above. I don't know if I have a better diagram of it. I think this is probably my original diagram. So zoom in. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to go higher there. Okay, so hopefully people can see that diagram. So, so what's going to happen is uh, Jeff on October 28th, he's going to present a summary of what we learned about the 391 and a half. And in that week, we're just going to have, you know, Jeff's going to be doing the classes, I believe, in the morning. Um, there's going to be a prayer meeting on Wednesday night. And I believe I present at the prayer meeting. I, I'm trying to remember exactly. So that's going to be right at right at the end of October, the beginning of November. I'm going to do a presentation. And the presentation is going to address the 390 days and the 40 days. That is, I'm going to look at Ezekiel's literal 390 days and 40 days. Okay. Now, when I'm explaining this, it's going to be, um, I can't think of her name. Sometimes a bad thing. I can't think of her name. But anyway, her and her family, it'll come, Brittany, Brittany's family, Brittany and her mom, are having a real hard time understanding this. So I'm doing this presentation. And what they see is while he lies on his left side for 390 days, and then his right side for 40 days. So shouldn't that be 430 days? So shouldn't we be looking at that the period ends 400, after 430 years, not 390 years and 40, right? Does that make sense? But and that's what most people do is they just add them together. They add the three hundred. Specifically mentioned, when being that Ezekiel specifically mentions forty days. Yeah, and three hundred ninety. But people just add them and together. I, so, so we're going to look at his, at Ezekiel's prophecy, and, and we will, um, you know, we we'll, we won't get done today. But that's the next thing we want to look at, and how. Uh, this relates to July 18th and why it's important. So in Ezekiel chapter 41, or chapter, chapter 41, chapter 40, I'm looking at verse 1. Um, we know that he's going to um, portray in verse 1, he's going to take a tile and lay it before himself and portray on it the city of Jerusalem. And then he's going to lay siege against this, this uh, portrayal. He's going to build a fort against it, cast a mount against it, set up, set the camp also against it, set up battering rams against it round about. So he makes a model of the city of Jerusalem and and a siege, right? And then he's going to take an iron pan and he's going to put it as a wall between him and the city. And then he's going to set his face against it and it shall be besieged. And thou shalt lay siege against it. This shall be a sign to the house of Israel. So he's acting out a parable, right? And then in verse four, it says, lie thou also upon thy left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity according to the number of the days. 390 days, so shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. Now, a lot of people have trouble with this. Now, how long did the kingdom of Israel last, of northern Israel? 
from the time of Jeroboam to the end of Hoshea's reign. <clears throat> yeah, 256 years. That's 256 years, right? And, <clears throat> and so people are wondering, well, what's he talking about 390 years? So this, this problem, you know, exists. The people don't understand this prophecy. Now, of course, you know, northern Israel has been destroyed, but it's pointing back to a time when their iniquity began and to a point in the future of Ezekiel of when this siege is going to begin. He, he knows that a siege of Jerusalem is going to happen because God's telling him this. And that it's going to be 390 years from when uh, the iniquity of, of northern Israel occurred. And that's going to be at the division of the kingdom of Israel into, into the northern and southern kingdoms. And then it says, when thou hast accomplished them, the 390 days, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. Now, in the Hebrew, you can see there, if you can see those strong numbers, it says H3117 and H8141, and then H3117 and H8141. And that's because in the Hebrew, it says a day to a year, a day to a year. It doubles it. So it repeats it twice. So why is it repeated twice? Like, why is it repeated? Why doesn't he just say, I've appointed thee a day for a year? It doubles the force. Okay, there's a doubling, but why? Why Why in Hebrew do you double things? To emphasize them? Yeah, it, it, it emphasizes it, right? Now, we also know that this is relating to uh, um, Numbers chapter, uh, I always forget. It's it's Numbers, What what's the chapter? You, 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 you showed it at the beginning of your study. 1434. Ah, 1434. Okay. Yeah. So if we just go back a little bit in, in verse 33, it says, And your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of days in which ye search the land, even 40 days, each day, for a year. And you can see again, it says 3117, 8141, 3117, 8141. It's exactly the same expression. A day to a year, a day to a year, shall ye bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. Okay. So Ezekiel is quoting uh, Numbers 14, verse 34. And we know if we, we add uh, 1434 with 4, um, four verse six, we get what? 1840. 1840, right? So we have another connection to Josiah, which is prophecy, right? And this is going to, of course, be the prophecy of Josiah that unlocks Ezekiel, uh, chapter four. So back in 2016, as I'm working through this chronology of the Bible, I, I know back in 2014 that there's 390 years from the dividing of the kingdom to the siege. But I hadn't really worked out particularly the prophecy of Josiah. And so as I work out the prophecy of Josiah in 1 Kings chapter 13, uh, where Jeroboam is offering on the altar of, of, on Beth, in Bethel on the 15th day of the eighth month, we're going to see that uh, this man of God comes and he cries against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, oh, altar, altar. So again, you have a doubling attached here, right? Thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee, right? And he gave a sign the same day, saying, this is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out, right? And it came to pass when the king, when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, lay hold on him. And his hand, which he had put forth against him, dried up so that he could not pull it again to him. And the altar also was rent and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign 
which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. So in, in 2016, I noticed this as I'm working through this chronology uh, because of the date, right? So in chapter 12, at the end, it's going to talk about uh, Jeroboam's uh, golden calves, right? And it's going to talk about this feast day that he sets up in 12 verse 32 of First Kings. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month on the 15th day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah, referring to the Day of Atonement, and offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made, and he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the 15th day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart, and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burnt set, burnt incense. And that's just going to follow in chapter 13, where the man of God comes. So, so it's in the time when he's offering on the 15th day of the eighth month. So, so I noticed that, right? And, and it's going to be November 22nd, uh, 977 BC that this, this happens. So, so I worked out this chronology. I noticed this prophecy of Josiah. And then I noticed that it's, it's connected with its fulfillment in second Kings chapter 23. And this is going to start in verse um, 15, where it says, moreover, the altar that was at Bethel and the high place, which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel to sin, had made both that altar and the high place. He break down and burned and the high place and, and burned the high place and stamped it small to powder and burned the grove. And Josiah turned himself and spied the sepulchers that were there in the mount and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchers and burned them upon the altar and polluted it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these words. Right. So the guy who had made the prophecy of Josiah, he's going to uh, find this man's bones. And then he said, what title is that that I see? And the men of the city told him it is the sepulcher of the man of God which came from Judah and proclaimed these things that thou hast done against the altar of, of Bethel. And he said, let him alone. Let no man move his bones. So they let his bones alone with the bones of the prophet that came out of Samaria. And then it says, all the houses also of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel had made, he provoked the Lord to anger. Josiah took away, right? Now, it was trying to place when this happened. And, and the only way that I could do that was by going to Second Chronicles. And, and so in here, this is going to appear to be in uh, the 18th year of Josiah. Because um, it's talking about things in the 18th year of Josiah, where he's going to find the, the scroll, the book of the law. And he's going to read this out and he's going to do lots of different things. But. Um, it's going to be in, it's going to be in second chronicles. I'm just trying to find, if I can find the reference. Let me see if I look here. Second chronicles. Um, Josiah is going to be about here somewhere. Yeah. So Josiah, he was eight years old when he began to reign. He reigned in Jerusalem for 31 years. And in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after God. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. And he break down the altars of Balaam in his presence and the images that were in the high, were on high above. Then he cut down in the groves and the carved images and the molten images. He break in pieces and made dust of them and strode upon it upon the graves of them that sacrificed unto them. And he burnt the bones of the priests upon their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. So he did. In the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim and Simeon and even unto Naphtali with their mattocks round about. Right. So he's going to begin doing this in the 12th year of his reign. And he's and it's going to take him time to do this. Right. So he's going to do it throughout all the land of Israel, not just in the land of Judah. And then he's going to return to Jerusalem. So if he begin this in his 12th year, it's very possible that the scene that that happens in um second kings chapter 23 is actually in the 13th year right because he's going to begin in Judah, Judah and Jerusalem and then he's going to go through Israel so it's a little bit of an assumption 
to prove that. Uh, but one of the things we have also that marks the 13th year is, is the start of Jeremiah's ministry. And that's going to be Jeremiah 25. So when it, when in, in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, so this is going to be, um, a year after Daniel has been taken captive, uh, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So that's uh, Nebuchadnezzar's accession year, which Jeremiah the prophet spake unto all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, from the 13th year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even unto this day, that is 23 and 20th year, uh, the word of the Lord hath come unto me, and I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye have not hearkened. So, so this is the 23rd year from the 13th year of Josiah. So that means we have the, the 13th year of Josiah is going to be what year? Anybody know? 627 BC. So 627 BC. And you would then subtract 22 years and you're going to have this being as 605 BC. So in 605 BC is the fourth year of Jehoiakim. And 606 would be the third year of Jehoiakim. And Daniel's going to be taken captive in the fall of 607, which is when uh, the third year of Jehoiakim begins. It's one of the ways that I know that Jehoiakim's reign is from fall to fall. There's other ways we know that as well. But um, but this is in 605, right? So it's going to be – and and when does, when does um, Nebuchadnezzar begin to reign? When does his dad die? His dad dies in uh, 605, is it? Yep, 605, right? So when it says it's the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, they just mean it's the year that he begins to reign. It's not the first year of his actual reign because it's going to be in the spring of 604 that the count of his reign begins that would officially be the first year of his reign. So so this is in 605, and, and the captivity has already begun. Right. So it began the year, well, maybe almost like a year and a half before something like that. OK, so so anyway, um, these are some details that we have to look at in under in order to understand Ezekiel. So when we look at Ezekiel chapter four, what we have is go back to this diagram. So he's going to have these 30 days and these 40 days. and so. We know that they're going to relate to or 390 days and 40 days, and they're going to relate to 390 years and 40 years, a day for a year. Now, in in the prophecy of the 40 years wandering in the wilderness, does the 40 years prophecy happen before the 40 years begins or after the 40 years begin? After? Yeah. So the 40 years have already begun. And then there's going to be a prophecy saying that, you're going to be 40 years in the wilderness. It's it's pointing to the time when the 40 years in the wilderness ends, not to when it begins. If, if you understand what I mean, right? Because they're already in the wilderness. We don't need to know when the 40 years began because they've already begun. What they need to know is when they're going to end. And so you would just count from the beginning to the end. So some people try to take Ezekiel chapter four, verse four to six, and they try to put it as a period of 430 years that's in the future. But if we're comparing it to what happened with the 40 years in the wilderness, so there, there's going to be 40 years in the wilderness because of 40 days that they searched out the land, right? Now, the 40 years that they search out the land, is that going to happen after the 40 years have already begun or before the 40 years have begun? It would be after the 40 years began, right? Because they've already been in the wilderness for a year. And then they're going to go search out the land. Okay. So when it says, I've given you a day for a year, the day is being given as the 40 days. He doesn't say, I'm going to give you a year for a day, right? Yeah, so, so some people get this mixed up. They don't, they don't quite understand these prophecies. Uh, some people have criticized 
Ezekiel's prophecy as not being as a symbol of a year day principle because they say, well, no, he has to lie on his side for 390 days because of the 390 years. And he has to lie on his side for 40 days because of the 490 years. But has the 390 years and the 40 years ended yet when he lies on his side? No. No. So all that God is doing is he's giving them a symbol of days to mark out when the years will end. So these are completely parallel in how we are to understand them. So so he's proclaiming something that has already begun. The 40 years has already begun and the 390 years have begun. They're going to end at the same time. But the thing that's going to 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 mark their end. Is is the time that's given. So. So. You know, if if um, the siege was on some other time. You know, it would have to be a different number of days and a different number of years, right? So God is just marking when the siege is going to occur. There's 350 years from the prophecy of Josiah to its fulfillment, but that doesn't tell you when they're going to end. And so God is going to use the prophecy of Josiah as the starting point to mark how many days he's going to lie on his left side and his right side. To show when the siege is going to begin. Does that make sense to people? I don't know if I said it very well, but because we have events that have already occurred, right? We already had the kingdom divided already, right? That's the sin of Israel. And, and we already had the prophecy of Josiah fulfilled. And the prophecy of Josiah is going to be at the beginning when the kingdoms divides, and then it's going to be fulfilled. And this is going to be used as where to count to find out when the siege begins. So if the siege was going to begin, you know, um, 50 years after uh, the prophecy of Josiah was filled, fulfilled, then it would have been 400 days that he lies on his left side and 50 days he lies on his right side. Now, just to finish off today, because I went a bit over time, just going to finish that story. So when uh, Brittany and her family was really confused, was the next day when I was shopping at Walmart in uh, in Arkansas there in, in Hot Springs that I that I figured this out. So it was I recognized that what actually was happening is that he lies on his left side and he's facing the siege. And then he rise, lies on his right side and he's still facing the siege both times. So that means the 390 days and the 40 na- days need to point to that specific date that's marked at the end of the 390 days and the beginning of the 40 days. So he's going to finish lying on his left side on the 10th day of the fifth month. And then he's going to begin lying on his right side the next night. And that's going to be August 15th, 591 BC. So what we have here is marked a symbol for the midnight cry, just like we have midnight when he begins the lying on his side for 390 days. And then we have the 10th day of the fifth month that he he finishes lying on his left side. That's last night that he lies on his left side. And, and so this shows that the 390 days and the 40 days point to the siege and the 390 years and the 40 years point to the siege. We don't add them together to get 430 years. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah it does. It okay. Make sense to yeah so what i had there was the symbol of the 10th day of the fifth month that's what we're going to look at uh next week we're going to look at these symbols how i came to july 18th with the 10th day of the fifth month and we'll see how far we get and then we'll look at the 26th day of the fourth month and how the prophecy of josiah and josiah lich's prophecy come together with the july 18 2020 prediction so I know there's a lot of information today, but you know people can watch the videos over if they want. A- any final comments before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the study today, and we just ask for your continued presence throughout this day. Help us to follow and serve you. And um, we pray for one another. We ask for your angels' care and protection. In Jesus' name, amen.